Good morning and welcome to today's forum featuring the candidates for the 55th Assembly District. I'm Jonathan Krauss, Director of Multimedia Journalism for WHBY, and I will be the moderator for today's forum. The candidates joining us today are Democrat Kyle Kehoe and Republican Nate Gustafson. Thank you uh, both for being, uh, joining us here today. In a moment, I'll be asking the candidates a series of questions provided by members of the Oshkosh Chamber of Commerce and a few that I brought along myself. The candidates will each have two minutes to provide their answers. We do have a timekeeper down here in front that will let the candidates know when their time is running out. And I ask that you do respect the time limit so I don't have to cut you off. Before we get to those questions, though, each candidate will have three minutes to provide an opening statement. In a random draw, Nate Gustafson elected to go first. So, Nate, go ahead. Well, thank you, first off, to the Venture Project for hosting, and Jonathan, thank you for moderating this debate. It's actually really kind of one of those election cycles that I think everyone's paying attention, and I think it's, it's awesome that we're able to put something like this together, especially in the home stretch. Um, so my name is Nate Gustafson. I am the representative of the 55th District. Uh, I actually live up in Fox Crossing. I'm born and raised Fox Valley. I've lived in town of Menasha, Fox Cross my entire life. Uh, with that being said, uh, I got politically involved when COVID hit, and I think a lot of people started opening their eyes to just seeing how government can affect their lives. And so that's when I really jumped into this fear saying, I need to change something, or my generation will not see the same freedoms maybe that my parents or grandparents' generations might have had. And so that's really what motivated me to get involved and start running. But then also my background in IT. So I actually went to school at Fox Valley Tech for cybersecurity. Uh, and now I do, I've worked with various companies in the area, Community First Credit Union, Theta Care, um, Novo Health, uh, doing healthcare IT as well as some cybersecurity stuff as well. And so that's really where a lot of my expertise lie and that's where I wanted to bring that down to Madison. Um, so this past session, being a freshman, I, was, I had the opportunity to actually sit on not only five committees, which uh, Judiciary, Ways and Means, State Affairs, uh, Labor and Integrated Employment, and uh, forgetting one off the top of my head there, but also the, the main one that I had the most interest in that I started with was the Speaker's Task Force on Artificial Intelligence, and that really was a, a deep dive into our state's uh, approach to how we're going to embrace AI as not only as a public entity, but as businesses do in the state, and how can we play a role in that. And so ultimately, that's where a lot of my time has been spent uh, down in the legislature is finding ways to especially alleviate our workforce crisis where we just don't have the bodies in our state. So with that being said, how, how can we leverage the tools that we have in the toolbox? So again, thank you very much. Appreciate everyone being here, and I look forward to uh, some great questions from all of you. Kyle, your opening statement, please. Hey, everyone. My name is Kyle Kehoe. I am uh, born and raised in Winnicani. Not born. I was born in Milwaukee, raised in Winnicani. Uh, growing up, you know, my mom and my stepdad owned a roofing construction business. I helped them out with that. My dad was a painter for 47 years. Got good working class parents. Uh, I studied criminal justice after high school. Uh, in fact, I, uh, while I was studying, I was a community service officer here in the city of Oshkosh. I was also, after college, I was a police officer for the village of Winnicani. Uh, I, after that, I transitioned into telecommunications where I worked with Verizon Wireless. My last few years there, I was a store manager for the, uh, in the city of Fond du Lac. Uh, you know, creating a, a strong team, you know, working with my clients, understanding the needs of the people that I work with to make sure that I was taking care of them on a day in, day out basis because strong employees create a strong environment. You know, that's the way that I look at communities as well, too. If you have strong representation, communication with your people within your community, you can have a strong community. There's no doubt in my mind. Now, fast forward to today, I've been selling real estate for the last 10 years. You know, my mom's been in it for about 15 years, and I asked her about 10 years ago, I said, what's real estate all about? Went and got my license, and now I've been selling, helping hundreds of folks throughout the Fox Valley over the last 10 years find their homes or sell their homes. Uh, only, you know, things changed in the last four years. You know, the cost of real estate, um, you know, buying, renting, um, uh, new construction has really gotten out of control. You know, we're seeing, you know, uh, new construction up 60% over the last four years. We're seeing rent up 106% in the Oshkosh Nina area over the last four years. 
In my opinion, this is unsustainable. You know, we have to make sure we have housing for our folks that live in these communities uh, and that it's affordable and equitable for anybody within the community. Um, you know, two years ago, I started on the Housing Advocacy Committee with the Wisconsin Realtors Association trying to find effective housing uh, options, you know, across the state, seeing if we can bring them into our community here, seeing if we can't build up our community with those same types of policies that help them be successful. I'm also on the Planning and Zoning Commission with the Town of Algoma. You know, it's an interesting, uh, you know, it's, it's very interesting to see all the new development come in and to, to be part of the process and creating the development within your, uh, you know, community. I want to use my vast experience uh, that I've gained in my professional career over the last 20 years to make the lives of the people in the 55th better. You know, and I know that I can do that because I care about people, truthfully, and I think that we can do better within the 55th and I appreciate the form. And also thank you to the Venture Project and thank you Jonathan Krause. I had that on the top and I forgot to say it, so thank you. All right, thank you. Time now to get into some of the questions and again, each candidate will have two minutes to respond to each of these and we will alternate who goes first as we go through the questions. Uh, first question will go to you, Kyle, and that is uh, the Wisconsin Constitution requires that each assembly district must be contiguous, as compact as practicable, and respect other political boundaries to the extent possible, with consideration given to keeping communities of common interest intact. Do you think the newly drawn 55th district meets those criteria? Yeah, I do. Um, you know, with every assembly district, you need 60,000 or approximately 60,000 people per assembly district. You know, when it comes into more of the rural communities, you know, obviously you won't get to 60,000 unless you do grab some of the more populous areas. So with the new 55th, there is a portion of Oshkosh, I'd say approximately a fifth of Oshkosh, maybe a little bit less. Uh, but then the rest of the community is, or the rest of the district is built up of rural communities. You know, we have Winnicani, Omro, Fox Crossing, Vinland, Clayton, Winchester, Wolf River, Black Wolf, Nakaima, Utica, Clayton, you know, I think I said Clayton, if I didn't, Clayton. Uh, so I, I do believe that, uh, you know, the map is contiguous now, you know, because I actually have been campaigning for about a year now, and I was campaigning in the old district. I was campaigning when the district went from Winnicott to Wapan. And, you know, when you looked at that district, there was parts of the district that weren't connected. And, you know, it's taken me a little bit to understand how, you know, um, campaigning works as I've been doing it for about a year now. So, you know, I just recently, you know, not too long ago, found out how it's separated by wards and how the wards, um, you know, are connected for um, either door knocking or, um, uh, you know, connecting into the communities. And, you know, it's been very interesting to understand, you know, how to be most impactful within the area that you're at. So I do believe that, um, you know, the area is contiguous. And I truly, I, I look through all the map variations when they first came through. So for those unfamiliar, um, when the maps were first changed, you know, there was, uh, you know, seven different map variations. And by all means, the map that was selected, I believe, is the fairest map that was out there. So. Okay. Thank you. Nate, your thoughts on the 55th redrawn? I personally think that the 55th does also fall within the parameters of what we would consider constitutional, though I do have some questions about other districts across the state. And ultimately what we're going to see is uh, the political shift of power and really what it comes down to is which, which party has the power and which way are they going to draw it to their, their favor. And I think ultimately the, the map that was brought forward, which was drawn by Governor Tony Evers and was voted by only the Republicans in the assembly uh, and then was signed, is probably our best bet in the sense of what falls in our, our scope of constitutional. Now, the, the one area I do have some question on is actually up in Fox Crossing. So I'm actually also, I forgot to mention this in the opening, I am a county board supervisor for Winnebago County, District 28. And District 28 goes right along Winchester Road, County Road II, and then if you know where the new Nina High School is, that was actually annexed into the Village of Fox Crossing. But surprisingly enough, in the assembly map, that is in the 53rd district now, not the 55th. So when we're talking about the political boundaries of particular municipalities, it, it was kind of interesting that they missed that area, even though I believe it should have probably been in the 55th. So currently, as it stands, I said, I think the, the map argument is settled for now, hopefully. Um, I do believe that going forward, there still will be conversation on it. I think uh, the Republicans did embrace the Iowa-style redistricting that I believe we should still look at going forward, just so we don't get into these battles again, especially when maybe a political force is in control of a 
entity such as the Supreme Court. All right, thank you. Uh, again, getting into some questions here submitted by Oshkosh Chamber of Commerce members. Pretty simple one here. What are your top three pri priorities if elected to office? And Nate Gustafson goes first. First and foremost, we need to find ways to make sure our constituents are getting the most money back because at this point we have record inflation, we have record spending, and I, even though I, I, I will go on record saying this, you know, a lot of times politicians don't like admitting mistakes, and I think one of my big mistakes actually this past session was approving the budget that came forward. I think we overspent as a state, and I think at this point we need to look at opportunities to get that money back to our constituents. Uh, my one of my big absolute priorities I'd love to accomplish while I'm still in the legislature would be finding a way to eliminate the state income tax. And part of that is going to be a bite-sized approach. So this past session, we actually introduced a middle-class income tax cut. We also introduced a retirement income tax-free. Uh, we also introduced, uh, I actually introduced with Senator Pat Testin uh, a policy that we actually see President Trump now embracing, which is no income tax on overtime. If you are the people keeping our society together, we want to make sure you are getting the reward of doing so. And then the other priorities I have definitely is AI. I mentioned that before and in, in solving some of the workforce crises we have. We don't have enough bodies come to our state. I think that is partially due to some of the, the policies such as the income tax. but. With, with what our current situation is, we have AI, we have this awesome tool that we can augment our current workforce that will supplement this gap of, of shortage that we have with the workers. So if we have one worker, we can make them as efficient maybe as two and a half. And then lastly, uh, there are some other priorities I'm looking at, such as uh, interchange fees, as well as minimum markup, which are very unpopular uh, for some folks, even on my side, but I think we can find a pretty good compromise. So when you have those swipe fees, when you're, you know, work, or when you're going and buying a product, uh, they're actually charging you a fee on top of the sales tax. And so I don't think that's fair that you're being charged a profit on top of a tax. So those are those are what I'm looking at for the next session. Kyle Kehoe, your top three priorities. Well, first and foremost, housing. You know, that's what I've been, uh, that's what I believe I can bring huge expertise in. Um, I certainly don't know all the answers, but I'm here and eager to understand more of the answers within the communities in order to make housing more equitable and more affordable throughout the district. Um, I believe that we can. Uh, I've seen it throughout the state in different types of development in which there's a partnership between public and private development. I think that if we work together, not only will it help solve some of the workforce issues that we have, uh, because if you can't have a house or if you can't have a place to live, it's tough to work inside the community. Um, but it will also, uh, you know, honestly build up our communities for generations to come. Uh, you know, secondly, I think that we should codify Roe v. Wade into the state constitution. I think that uh, a woman's right to choose is very important. I think that this is America and that we have that right and that we shouldn't be here to persecute people to, um, to make their own choices, you know, in that regard. And then lastly, I would like to make sure that education is funded properly. You know, when we go and we look at uh, our workforce and our workforce development, how can we not connect this back to education? If we have people that are ready for workforce coming out of high school, coming out of college, coming out of tech, coming out of trades, we're creating homegrown Wisconsinites that are ready to work for their state. Like that's how I look at it. And this goes for a huge range of workers. You know, this, you know, if you look at some of the schools now, they really start to try to set these kids up for success. I have some personal experience uh, with my uh, girlfriend's daughter who is a CNA uh, for one of the retirement communities in town. And she is starting her life as a junior and senior in high school and getting ready for college to make sure that she has all of the information needed to be uh, the best uh, medical professional that she can in the future. So I think that if we work together, we build up our people, we build up our education systems, it'll be better for everybody here in Wisconsin. All right, thank you. We'll move on to our uh, next topic, and that is uh, Wisconsin currently has a $4.6 billion budget surplus. Do you support sending those surplus funds back to taxpayers and small businesses? Do you think government should keep it, or do you support a middle-class tax cut? And Kyle Kehoe, you were first. Well, I think uh, when you have $4.6 billion, there's lots of things that you can do with it. And a lot of those things that you just said right there are things that can be accomplished. But I don't think that we should do any one of them individually. Do I believe in middle class tax breaks? Heck yes, I do. You know, there's no doubt that the middle class is what makes Wisconsin great. I also believe that the middle class has been bearing a lot of the brunt 
for a long time here in the state of Wisconsin, 10 to 15 years from a lack of uh, shared revenue coming back to the cities. So what happens when your city doesn't have enough shared revenue? Well, your city has to increase taxes. They still have bills to pay. They still have to make sure that those requirements are met. And if they're not doing it, then what happens? Well, it's put on the middle class. It's put in our property taxes. You know, if your school's not funded well enough from the state level, what happens? Well, now your school has to go up for referendum to meet basic commodity needs. You know, we're seeing this throughout, throughout the district where we have school districts that go you know, referendum after referendum just to make basic needs. And who's taking the brunt of that? Who's paying for the brunt of that? Our taxpayers within these communities. You know, so let's start bringing some of that shared revenue back to our cities. Let's put it in the hands of the people that know how to use it best. And let's move forward with Wisconsin using that money as best as possible. Nate, your plans for the state budget surplus. Well, I think I made it pretty clear also in my last uh, answer where, where I stand just with our budget in general. And I think giving, again, finding that way to get that money back to our constituents. Um, I think the first m mindset that a lot of people have, even now, I put throw some Republicans in this camp, is when we have a big pool of money, they think we need to spend it right away. And I think ultimately we should be looking at, okay, we're squeezing, as, as actually Kyle was saying, we are squeezing the middle class here, and we're taking all this additional money that we didn't need to even have in the first place. And so if we're going to sit here and, and say, well, we, you know, we're, we're going to pile up all this money and then we're going to spend it on more stuff, even though we, we technically had the surplus to begin with, that didn't matter. So, and now I kind of want to get back to a point though that Kyle was bringing up about uh, shared revenue, because actually the legislature did pass and the governor did sign. Uh, and I believe it was when the shared revenue was passed, it was Republican heavy of the Act 12, which was a historic investment in the shared revenue, as well as actually the last session, we did also do historic investment in school funding as well, probably the largest funding, almost a billion dollars. Uh, so we actually had that in our current budget that we did pass. But I don't believe going beyond that right now is, is fiscally responsible for anyone in the state of Wisconsin. And we need to really find a way to release the valves that is the economic pressure on everyone in our, in our district. So, right, Thank you. also like to thank both candidates for staying within the time limits here. You're doing a great job. Again, uh, questions submitted from Oshkosh Chamber of Commerce members. Uh, given the nature of free markets, state government has a limited role in creating jobs and driving business growth. Still, the government can certainly help create a more competitive business climate through forward-thinking policy decisions. With that in mind, what policies would you advocate for to make Wisconsin more competitive with respect to attracting businesses and good-paying jobs to the state? And Nick Gustafson, you're first. Yeah, I think ultimately, I mean, we can look at last session too, where Wisconsin, uh, as a part of the budget, which again, Republicans proposed, Tony Evers signed, uh, we finally eliminated the rest of the prop, uh, personal property tax on businesses, which is a huge windfall for for these businesses, as well as when these businesses are struggling on workforce, do they want to bring somewhere where it's not, in ta you know, really tax incentive for people to come move to our state? Hence why I, I have the strong policy of finding ways to eliminate that state income tax tax because once you have that eliminated, yes, there are going to be other areas where you may see uh, a trickle up in, in certain taxes that we, we're going to have to balance it out, but ultimately it gives the power to the consumer or the, our constituent to choose when they want to spend. And I think a lot of times when we look at uh, like the housing needs as well, I think that is obviously one of the incentives that the state legislature had passed a whole package to increase our housing in the state. But again, if the tax policy doesn't come along with the housing policy, people are not wanting, they're, they're not going to come to Wisconsin. They're going to go to Tennessee, Florida, Texas, where they don't have that income tax and they have a lot more uh, liberties with their money when they receive it. So I think that's really where we need to look going forward is finding the, the, levers to pull that are going to attract the workforce, as well as you look at some some of the historic investments, even under Scott Walker, when we actually had the Foxconn property, though Foxconn fell through, the pre preparation of that brought Microsoft and $3.3 billion and upwards of probably going to be 2,000 jobs to Wisconsin. So what are what are those incentives looking like? How are we going to continue to structure? And let's, let's be a leader in, in setting kind of the, the new standard of the upper Midwest of why you want to come work and live here. So Kyle, your thoughts on improving the state's business climate? Yeah, I think uh, that we should have a state-backed 
uh, small business startup program. You know, I believe that I've talked, I've been in real estate for a long time. I've been dealing with small business owners for the last 10 years. Uh, in fact, a lot of them have a difficult time starting up. It's the hardest part. You know, a lot of times it comes down to, you know, low equity or low assets available to them. And when they go to lenders in the area, you know, the lenders also have a business to run. So, you know, they may look at them as more risk profile and they may not uh, lend to them. You know, I just worked with a client over this last uh, six months in which they were trying to purchase a golf course in town, you know, and like this was, um, you know, hardworking individual, him and his neighbor. And, you know, both of them pulled equity out of their houses for down payments. Both of them uh, were doing everything right, everything that you're told to do, but they could not find a lender in the area to help them out. And I'm not faulting the lenders in the area. You know, I understand, like I said, that they have a business to run, but we also need to have a funnel for these people to start new businesses in town. We need to make sure that we have an opportunity for startups throughout the area and that it's not just a select few that can start up businesses. We want to make sure that we have diversity throughout, you know, and this comes down to, um, you know, making and having a um, a way for them to get started, which I believe that we can do through, you know, fund that's specific for small businesses and startups. You know, make it something where it's streamlined. You know, because as soon as we start talking about, sometimes there can be a lot of bureaucracy. We want to make sure that it's easy to do, that it's uh, attainable for the vast majority of people. We want to make sure that they can take advantage of it and start. Uh, new businesses within our community within our communities to be part of the chamber so I really appreciate the question all right we'll move on uh, talk a little bit about act 10 if the Wisconsin Supreme Court were to overturn act 10 would you support legislation to re-establish it and Kyle you go first no I would not um, I am not gonna you know mince words too much I uh, believe in education you know, I believe uh, that we need to make sure that our kids have uh, strong teachers. I think that these teachers should have protections within their job. I have a lot of admiration for teachers. I mean, I don't know if any of us could sit in a room with uh, 25 uh, fifth graders or third graders throughout an entire day and still have our sanity. Uh, you know, uh, the reality is, is that it is a tough job. And like, you know, there could be a lot of criticism in terms of uh, how many hours or how many months are worked out of the year. but we all know that's not actual reality. Teachers are working past the end of the school year and they're working before the school year starts. And the reason they do it is because of the passion for these kids. You know, they want to make sure that these kids are set up for success in Wisconsin. You know, they want to make sure that our neighborhoods, or I'm sorry, that our communities are strong with our school districts that we have within our communities. And I'll tell you what, from being a person in real estate over the last 10 years, if you don't think that squ strong school districts are important for strong communities, got another thing coming. You know, because that's a very important thing to a lot of the people that I've worked with throughout the area. You know, I'm not bringing it up to them. They're bringing it up to me. You know, they want to be in areas with strong schools. And I think we can have strong schools if we remove Act 10. Nate, your thoughts on Act 10? Yeah, first off, I actually want to agree a lot. And this is going to be one of those weird spots with... with uh, typically opposing sides. I, I do agree strong schools make a strong community and we have great teachers in our county especially. Um, I am a product of the Nina School District. K through 12 went all the way through. I had fantastic teachers. Unfortunately what we've seen though is uh, a bloat in the administrative state that oversits a lot of these school districts and eventually that sucks up a lot of the oxygen out of the room as you know I was kind of talking about before and the funding for the teachers that deserve to be paid better. Now with that being said if we were to reverse something like Act 10, the local budgets across the board would have an absolute dumpster fire going on where I don't know how we would even go about that, but I think it would be significant tax increases on just about everyone anywhere that works any <laughs> any job and they're not going to, at the end of the day, I don't think it's feasible. And I think really it saved our country, or it saved our state, sorry, of, of some of the deficit that we had coming into it when Act 10 was proposed. And I think that's why we do have historic surpluses is because of the fact that we were able to get something like Act 10 done. So no, I would not, I, I, would, or I would pass something to uh, bring Act 10 back if that was the opportunity. I, I believe that is a strong uh, piece of legislation that, again, got our state moving in the right direction. All right, follow up on something that both mentioned here. Uh, the state imposes levy limits, uh, how much property tax local municipalities and governments can uh, collect each year. Do you support those, or what changes would you propose to those? And Nate, you go first. 
I think current legislation is almost in the right spot. I think there are some conversations that I've, we've been having of what it's going to look like uh, if there were any sort of uh, lifting on that, uh, especially with budgets. But again, I think this comes back to, you know, you're working within a certain limit that, that we've set as a legislature. What financial burdens are these communities taking on that either A, the state then, because of setting these limits, can help? Uh, but other than that, I, I think we need to really relook at our budgets and making sure, obviously, I know inflation, there's been issues, but I think at the end of the day, we need to make sure that uh, we're, we're spending fiscally responsible within our communities. So I don't see a whole lot of movement when we, in my opinion, from the legislature, uh, addressing some of the levy limits uh, going, going into the next session. Kyle, levy limits. Yeah, I do. Uh, I do agree with uh, increased levy limits. You know, I mean, if we don't have increased levy limits, you know, we're already seeing what happens when we don't have increased levy limits. You know, we see increased property taxes. We see school referendums. You know, we see this whole slew of additional middle class tax uh, hikes that we don't need if we were being funded properly from the state. You know, this district is built of a lot of rural communities, and rural communities have a more difficult time than more metropolitan areas just because they don't have as many people or have as many businesses that are putting into the pool. You know, so because of that, you know, I grew up in Winnicott. You know, rural communities to me are really important. You know, like we start a huge, great pipeline of people coming from these small communities that are strong, you know, hardworking, strong-willed, and we have to make sure that they have the right facilities and that they have the right funds to make sure that their villages, cities are running properly. You know, I've had uh, the pleasure of speaking with administrators throughout the area, and they are doing a heck of a job. They are working their butts off to make sure that they are helping their city as much as possible. But when you get into deep conversations with them and you look at, you know, different city or different, you know, different villages, they're having to start to cut services, you know, services that these people in these communities really rely on, you know, really important to them. And, and if you start the destruction of those processes, it can be so difficult to rebuild them. So, yes, I do. Uh, uh, I do believe that. Excuse me, that we should increase levy limits. I believe that we should do it fiscally responsibly. I think that we have the abilities to do that. I do believe that everything is about compromise. I'm not saying open up the floodgates and let all the money keep rolling in. I'm saying that we can be smart about it and we can lift up our communities one community at a time and leave it up to the experts within the community to do the best they can. Let's switch focus now, talk about uh, workforce here in Wisconsin. Study after study shows that we will have a shortage of workers in the future. Additionally, the demographics of the state's population indicate that more people will be leaving the workforce in the future than entering it. We continually hear from employers who are experiencing shortages in workforce, and it's occurring in all sectors of the economy. How do you plan to get more workers to Oshkosh, and where do you think they should live when they move here? <laughs> I, so, I'd love to follow up uh, to that because that is a really important part. You know, I mean, like if you don't have an equitable, affordable place to live, it's really hard to move to a community. Even if you're an up and coming, let's say you're from Oshkosh and you want to keep living here and you want to move out from your folks' house and you want to go, well, median rent in the Oshkosh Nina area from a USA Today article says that it's $1,800 per month now. It is a 106% increase over the last four years. How are we setting our workforce up to succeed when they can't even afford to live? You know, I would love to have affordable housing within the area, and I'll work hard to make sure that it gets there. The reality is, is that not only do we have to have housing, but we have to make sure that they're set up for success. We have to make sure that our education systems are well-funded. We have to make sure that people, you know, regardless of what pathway these children want to take or these young adults want to take, that we have a pathway for them, that we have uh, trade schools that are flourishing, that we have uh, tech schools that are flourishing, you know, four-year schools that aren't in these budget deficits, you know, because they're underfunded. You know, that's the reality. Uh, the reality is, is that we need a whole wide range of workforce. Workforce is a very, very general term to say contractors, plumbers, doctors, nurses, firefighters, teachers. It's everything within our community, people that we interact with on a day-to-day -day basis. And I'll always fight for the people within this district. There's no doubt about it because I believe in the people within this district. And I think in order to bring workforce development additionally to Oshkosh, it needs to be a private and public sector uh, relationship to understand the needs that are required and that we work from the state level to make sure that we have a good pipeline for these folks coming into these communities. Nate boosting workforce and housing. 
Absolutely. And I, I, I agree that, I mean, with, with Kyle in the sense of we, how are people are like, especially, I want to say this as a millennial and Gen Z and Gen Alpha coming up too, how are they supposed to stay in the community that they grew up in when the housing is just out of control and pricing? Well, if they're, obviously we have strong schools, which I do think we actually do still have strong schools here. I think they are funded quite adequately with recent funding. But also, I think we have to look at the starting point of if you're going to accumulate wealth in any way, shape, or form in the area, your first barrier of that are the taxes that we put on you. And that's where, again, leaning back on finding ways to alleviate the, the state income tax to want to first be an attractive place for people who want to move. Second, once they're getting here, especially as we're looking at some of the uh, housing options, again, if it, the median uh, rent price is 1800 a month, what's driving that price up? And a lot of times it comes back to regulation with that has been set in place that makes it only profitable for any developer to come in and build what we consider the luxury apartments. So what regulations need to be scaled back? How do we put more money back in the pockets of, of everyone rather than just giving them money for you know rent or whatever it may be? And then that is going to be your, your successful model there, bringing people at least into the area where they can live, work, and want to stay here. That's, that's the other key is once they get here, do they want to stay here? And we need to retain our workforce as we find that gap coming. Uh, the silver tsunami, I, I apologize for everyone who, who might fall in that category right now. But the silver tsunami is coming. It's real. Uh, we are one of the first first times in, I think, American history where we don't have enough people uh, coming into the workforce to replace the workforce that's retiring. And so that's going to be a significant hurdle that the legislature is looking at right now. Hence why a lot of, you know, there's going to be a lot of facets to that solution. And that's where, again, I believe one of those facets is the implementation of AI to fill some of those roles. So. Expanding beyond housing here, a little follow-up on this. How do you think the younger generations currently view Wisconsin, and what can be done to keep the best and brightest here in the workforce? And Nate, you go first on this one. Yeah, again, I, I think a lot of my generation see the opportunities elsewhere, and that I think is a significant problem where they might get a good education, they might be able to live at home and go to UW Oshkosh, or they might go to Madison, but when they look at the job prospect, if they're not staying in some of the more metropolitan areas, is, they're going to leave the state. And again, a lot of this comes back to you look at where's the housing, where's, you know, where can they keep the most money in their pocket? And a lot of times you look at somewhere like Texas, where I know it's an absolute flood of people going to Texas right now, Florida, Tennessee. And so right now, I think we need to get competitive in the, in the tax sphere for our income tax brackets. I think we need to find ways that are going to uh, allow people to start the American dream here because I think right now we don't even have that opportunity. I, in my personal opinion, I think a lot of where we've been priced out as a generation, we're going to be looking for the opportunities to go probably somewhere else to find that job. So putting that money back in your pocket, making it affordable for you to live here and having options for you to live here and, and really start the cycle too. I mean, right now, if you, a, lot, a lot of you might not know, but we have this pool of, uh, of people such as myself that are you know starting their families, looking for that starter home. You have the silver tsunami also looking for the exact size same home. And so we have this bottleneck right now where people aren't moving, people aren't. And then there's the, the middle section that can't really downgrade because there's not a generation ready to buy the next size house. And so that's one of the problems I know we've been trying to solve in the legislature as well uh, with some of our housing bills. Kyle, how uh, the youth view Wisconsin and how we can keep them here? Yeah, I actually couldn't disagree more with uh, Representative Gustafson. I think our youth uh, is excited. You know, I think that our youth is uh, uh, very adaptable to the changing times, but they are ready for something better. You know, I just went up to the local 400 plumber and steam fitters. Uh, they had their apprentices that just started two weeks ago, and it was a 20% increase from year over year. You know, we're seeing this increase in trades, you know, and that's a fantastic thing. You know, I have a, um, uh, you know, a theory that, you know, our Gen Xers were the last big generation, the last big trade generation. You know, those are our current, you know, electricians, plumbers, uh, contractors, and now their kids are coming up. You know, Gen Z kids are coming up, and, you know, they've their eyes are open to understanding. Understanding, hey, you know what? If I work hard, I can do well. 
I can make a good living in, the, in here in Wisconsin, and I want to make sure that we take care of them. I want to make sure that their schooling is less expensive if they want to go to four-year school or two-year school. I want to make sure that when they get out of school, that they don't have a debt load that makes it impossible to start their, their life or their family. I want to make sure that they have the tools needed to be successful within our communities. And I do have a lot of faith that these generations, you know, just like us millennial generations, you know, may not be as easy as it was for previous generations, but it is definitely attainable, especially if we have a government that is working for the people and not just for um, special interests. We have to make sure that we are equitable across the board and making sure that uh, we're taking care of people. And I do believe that Gen Z or Gen Alpha coming up, you know, my son is 14, 14 today. Happy birthday. Uh, so he is 14 today, four years away from, you know, starting to make his decisions on what workforce looks like. And I'm excited to watch that growth and watch him learn. And I've been really energized hearing all the Gen Zers uh, across the district. All right. Thank you. Let's switch to education. Uh, one of the fastest growing costs for Wisconsin public school districts is special education. The state currently funds those programs at a level around 31%. Districts are calling for that percentage to be increased to 66%. Should the state provide additional funding for special education as the number of students in those programs continues to increase? And Kyle, you're first. Yes. Uh, that is the easiest answer to come out right away. Uh, we should increase special education funding. There are federal regulations that state that we have to fund these special needs programs to a certain level. And if we're not funding these programs to a certain level, that means that these school districts have to take money out of their general funds in order to make up that difference. Well, what happens when your school starts taking too much money out of its general fund? Referendums. And who has to pay for referendums? We all do, you know, and it's just coming as a, you know, if, if a school has to pay for a referendum, you take a, you take a city like Amro or even a city like Oshkosh when it came to funding, uh, you know, the new schools within the area, um, you know, we are fortunate enough that we have enough caring people within the area that we understand that these needs have to be met, that we have to do these increases, but we will see a direct impact on our property taxes when that happens, when those referendums are passed. So how do we offset some of that? Well, or funding special education is a great start. You know, now these funds don't have to be taken from the general funds. Now the general fund can be used for things that it should be used for. And I do believe that if we uh, fund it properly, that it'll trickle down effect in terms of how all the other uh, processes work within the school and how the funding works within the school, uh, because they'll have these extra funds available. Nate, special education funding. Yeah, I think I think it's going to be an opportunity that we're going to have to look at in the next budget. I'm, I'm not saying that uh, we're, we're going to absolutely fund it to the maximum. I think there was an increase, I believe, in the last budget for special education funding. I think it's something we do have to look at. Um, I do uh, want to applaud uh, my opponent for embracing trickle-down economics. Uh, and <laughs> just that's a joke. Uh, but I, I do think it's a conversation that we're going to have. And I've sat down with a lot of the school districts, sat, sat down with at CESA 6, where we've heard this is a significant issue. Um, I, I can at least recognize that in finding what, what's going to be the appropriate way to find some additional funding for that. All right. Sticking with education, uh, the state currently uh, provides funding for school choice program and charter school options as well. Uh, your thoughts, do they provide better education for kids, and should the state keep its current education funding in place with the voucher program as well? Yeah, absolutely. With that historic public education funding that we also did in the last budget, we also had historic school choice funding. And at the end of the day, the, the dollars should really follow the student. And the schools that are providing the best education or the best opportunity for the students should be available to them. And I think ultimately what we've seen, a lot of the area, uh, here we have obviously a few choice schools, but we really look at the bigger impact of like the Milwaukee area schools where we find that some of their public ed education is failing their students and there's an opportunity for underserved students to attend these choice schools. So ultimately, I'm going to say we, we need to continue to fund both. I think it's good to have competition. I think that's part of the issue where I think a lot of people felt that maybe public education didn't have enough competition. I think competition brings out the best of every entity. Kyle, your thoughts on school choice and charter schools? Uh, I'm not running 
for assembly in Milwaukee. I'm running for assembly in the 55th district. Uh, the assembly in the 55th district needs to make sure our public schools are funded properly. You know, over this last year, I have taken a lot of time to understand what funding looks like, you know, what funding in the private sector or private schools looks like, what funding in the public schools look like. A lot of times it comes down to cost per pupil is what it comes down to. Well, right now, private schools get $11,500 per pupil, while public schools get $9,000 per pupil, approximately. And if you look at this, remember, 90% of kids in the state of Wisconsin go to public schools. 90%. This is not a small majority. This is the vast majority. These are the schools that we need to concentrate on are our public schools. I am not here to say anything negative against private schools. People certainly have their choice to send their kids to private schools. But sending your kids to private schools is your choice. We do have a public free option. If you do decide to send your kids to public school or private school, uh, do I believe in the voucher program? I think that we could start scaling back some of the vouchers to make sure that we have the necessary funding when it comes to the public schools. You know, when we look at our budgets and we look at being, um, you know, uh, conservative or, you know, um, conservative or understanding or compromise within our budgets, it's give and take. And we have to make sure that we're giving to the vast majority of folks and not the small minority of folks. So I do uh, believe that we should fund public schools better, and I am in a, I am in agreement with rolling back some of the private school um, vouchers. All right, thank you. Sticking with education, a question from uh, Oshkosh Chamber members. Apprenticeships and internships give students hands-on experience that leads to meaningful opportunities. We need to do more to give students practical work experience while they're in high school. Should the state incentivize schools more to partner with their local employers to offer students these important real-world career experiences as part of their high school coursework? And Kyle, you get to go first. Yeah. Uh, we should, absolutely. You know, this comes up setting people up for success. Um, you know, I grew up uh, either painting houses with my dad on the weekends uh, or when he was doing side jobs or I or roofing houses with my mom and my stepdad. You know, I am not afraid of hard work. Um, I believe that uh, there is value within any type of employment and there's dignity within any type of employment. Um, if we set these kids up, you know, it's interesting. Um, you know, my experience in high school is over 20 years ago. Yeah, I know. Uh, but like, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I know. <laughs> but like, uh, you know, the, the reality is, is like we have evolved the way that we get kids ready for schools a lot differently than we did even 20 years ago. Um, you know, 20 years ago, I sat down in my guidance counselor's office and he's like, what do you want to do? I'm like, I want to be a cop. <laughs> and he's like, all right, you should go to UBO and uh, go for criminal justice. And that's where my journey began. And it obviously isn't that anymore. You know, I've changed and adapted what I've done for my career up until this point. But we have to make sure that we have a successful pipeline and uh, for these kids coming up, regardless of where the job is. And if it comes down to internships, which I have heard that we do have local employers in the area, uh, plumbers, electricians, contractors that do already work uh, with kids starting in high school. And that's fantastic. You know, like there's no better way of gaining experience. And I hope that five, seven, 10 years down the road, they start their own business. And they start, and we start getting a competitive environment with our trades so that we have a whole slew of people that are available to do this type of work within our, uh, within our community that's equitable for all. Nate, state support for internships and apprenticeships. Absolutely. I think it's one of our, it's going to be the backbone really of Wisconsin at this point. It was actually quite interesting, uh, especially with this question. Uh, I was actually able, had the opportunity to tour the local operating engineers 139 last week, and they were talking about some of their, their struggles that they were having with bridging that gap with some of the high schools and getting in and finding ways that, you know, maybe credits that they're actually achieving there can apply towards uh, some sort of education that would translate to uh, the, the, the field that they're going into. And so that's something I know for a fact we'll be looking at uh, next session. And I think a lot of what we've seen, and I hate to do this to you, Kyle, uh, I actually graduated 
11 years ago and it's very very much how they adjusted <laughs> and how they've adjusted even from just then 11 years ago to now they they're preparing people for a completely different workplace than than we were even 10 years ago and so ultimately i think there's going to be great ways that we can find historic investment i believe in in finding ways to partner with some of these trades and making sure again we have that workforce that's available that we need that is clearly uh, not there yet but i think we can still turn turn the page on this and, and get the right direction for our state. Let's talk about roads. Gas taxes and registration fees are not supplying enough revenue to address the state's current and future transportation needs. How does Wisconsin address the shortfall occurring in the transportation budget? And Nate, you're first on this one. Significant issue. Um, this has been an issue. Uh, obviously, as, as culture and our society continues to embrace electric vehicles, uh, whether that's good or bad, that, that's besides the point. Uh, we, we understand that there's this shortfall. And right now, I know in the last budget, we did actually have to increase the vehicle registration on, on electric vehicles because of the fact that our gas tax was taking a hit from, from not, obviously, people uh, paying because they weren't using gas. Um, ultimately, I, I am in favor, and though this could be a very unpopular stance, even among my own colleagues, uh, I am in favor of toll roads. I think there are some opportunities that we're going to need to look at uh, around the state to find uh, ways to implement these to backfill a little bit some of our, our funding needs because right now at the end of the day we all want good roads we all want good infrastructure you pay taxes right now those toll roads can help also offset that cost and I think at the end of the day we have to look at opportunities like that as well as again how how sustainable is the gas tax going to be going forward and so I think that's where we've seen obviously certain communities to uh, shift towards a wheel tax so it's kind of a interesting uh, kind of balance that we're still working through, but I think those are all options on the table. Kyle, the transportation budget. Yeah, I, um, I, I do believe that we need additional funding into the transportation budget. I think that it can come from all sorts of uh, different funding solutions. I do not believe in pulls um, I, or the tolls. Uh, uh, that to me is a middle class tax um, that it's gonna affect the majority of people and uh, I do believe that that would negatively impact, um, you know, Wisconsinites. You know, it's just an additional fee that you'd have to pay uh, day to day um, on your normal, regular commute. Um, I. I've been in real estate for a long time. You know, I've seen it across different communities to understand the importance of good roads. Um, I've understood how expensive good roads can be nowadays. Um, you know, the reality is, is that these costs have skyrocketed. You know, if you go and get a hundred foot uh, road done in the city of Oshkosh, it's probably in front. Uh, you're, uh, prior to the real tax change, uh, it would have been uh, you know approximately twenty five thousand or fifteen to twenty five thousand dollars, dependent on your frontage. Um, the reality is, is you know a lot of these roads that are getting done, especially in our communities around here, those end up being first time home buyer homes. You know where the roads are being done because it's our more legacy areas. Well, guess what? All of your equity was just lost because a road just got changed in front of your house without anything that you could do about it. Did it need to re be replaced? Yeah, probably. Did you have to take on the brunt of that fee? I mean, probably not. You know, um, I think that we should do more state funding, you know, from these things. I think that we should be smart within our funding. Uh, I think that we can work on compromises to make sure that we are not increasing, you know, our middle class or low class taxes. I think that we need to make sure that we're paying attention to uh, all of our rural communities in the area as well, too, because if you think it's expensive in Oshkosh, it's certainly expensive in rural communities because they don't have the tax base or the amount of people in order to offset that amount. So I do believe in uh, increasing funding for <laughs> transportation budget. Thank All you. Right. Again, I'll let you go over just a little bit, but <laughs> I think we're doing pretty. I think we're doing pretty well. You so. are. You're doing a great job. This is the best one ever. Uh, let's switch to uh, AI and technology. Uh, we've seen an explosion in businesses now use, uh, utilizing artificial intelligence, but we're also seeing the growth of high energy demand projects like data centers. Wisconsin's current regulatory process delays the build out of needed in energy infrastructure to support those projects. And as a result, the state's losing out on some of that uh, projects that are essential to the future of the economy. What, if anything, is your plan to streamline the energy regulatory process at the PSC or otherwise to help attract these high demand energy projects to Wisconsin? And Kyle, you're first. 
I am in favor of streamlining processes in order to make sure that we have the energy needs that we need within the state of Wisconsin. I need to make sure that the environment is also kept top of mind. One of the reasons that so many of us are in this building right now and people that are watching online, the reason that we love Wisconsin so much is because of its natural beauty. You know, we have to make sure, you know, Winnebago County has a lot of water. You know, we got Lake Winnebago, we have uh, Lake Butamore, Lake Winnicani, Poygan. We have to make sure that we're keeping these uh, facilities safe and uh, full and, and make sure that we're not allowing for overdevelopment that is impactful to this. You know, we don't need to sacrifice our environment in order to be competitive within the energy sector. I think that that's an important thing to remember is that we can streamline and we can make sure that these businesses can be up and running without sacrificing the things that make this state beautiful and this area beautiful. And I would agree that uh, streamlining or making it easier for some of these uh, utility companies to get up and running to uh, a to supply power to these uh, data centers will be great. You know, I mean, I think that that would be a good start. Neat. So this past session, we dealt with what I consider the largest piece of legislation that was untalked about, and that was called Right of First Refusal, AB 470. AB 470 essentially removed any sort of competitive bidding when it came to building new transmission lines within our state, which ultimately meant that the utility companies that already, in my opinion, have a stronghold, if not a monopoly in our state, were able to bid first without any sort of competition, whatever they wanted, passing whatever that price was onto you and I, the utility rate payers. Um, I felt that was wrong. I felt, again, I'm strong in the camp of competition. Uh, I believe that legislation, so that legislation did fail uh, the Senate last year. I do believe it will be coming back. Um, I am adamantly opposed to such policies such as that would that would drive up the cost for you and I consumers. Now, back to what you were saying about data centers and how we might be kind of losing out. I mean, I've actually had a conversation just yesterday with some Microsoft representatives, and they their philosophy is they want to pay fully for whatever infrastructure needs they're going to need to fund their data centers. Unfortunately, because of PSC, with their partnerships with We Energy, they uh, find a way to say no, and they're and they don't have to, and they, there's no incentive for We Energies to move because there's no competition. So at the end of the day, uh, we're going to have to watch for policies like that, which I know will be coming back that I will be fighting, as well as uh, as Kyle was saying. I mean, again, when we're looking at our our natural resources in our state, it's a gorgeous state, and when we look at clean energy, we need to look beyond. Uh, the wind and solar that a lot of people like to embrace first and foremost, and we need to look at nuclear. And I know that's a very, very big topic right now down in Madison is how are we going to find a way to embrace nuclear as a state because that is going to provide the most energy for our demands going forward, especially some of these data centers, and uh, again, not leave the environmental impact like maybe previous uh, energy sources have. All right. I think we have time for one more question. I'm going to jump back to education here. A question from Chamber member. Is the state of Wisconsin doing all that it can and all that it should do to provide state tax dollar funds to support access to educational opportunities through the UW system? And Nate, you're first. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's going to be the touchy subject right now as we approach the next budget. I know the UW system came out and asked for, I believe, over $850 million in the same time that they're consolidating their campuses, especially a lot of the two-year schools. We know, obviously, in Winnebago, UW Fox City's uh, campus is shutting down. Um, but when you're shutting down these two-year schools and you're consolidating into, you know, let's say Oshkosh or Green Bay, even if that's close enough, that what what cost are you still bearing that runs this deficit? Where where are your your actual budget looking? I know, uh, actually, kudos to the chancellor, even though I know he just announced he'll be uh, resigning at the end of the school year. Um, I think he he put some of the first steps in place that is going to make the not only the University of Oshkosh at least financially more viable, but going into the future and finding ways to uh, ultimately pretty much save save the school from having any additional you know uh, threat of shutdowns. Um, I think when we're looking at the next budget too, we need to also look at. Uh, what what is the UW as a whole funding? And I think there are some, uh, obviously, from a very Republican conservative standpoint, uh, we have a lot of issues with where a lot of the funding is going towards, rather than quality, is more towards equity. And I think a lot of times, once you have those conversations, you're boxing out uh, a lot of Wisconsinites from opportunities. So 
if we're going to continue funding or have con conversations of more funding, we need to have those conversations of is are these schools available to everyone, not just a particular sub subset of people that may be included in a, a certain program or a certain you know, entity. But I, again, I think there's a lot of uh, additional funding that we've been giving them that I believe have, hasn't been spent wisely and we're working through that with them now. Kyle, UW funding. Yeah, I, uh, you know, UW funding, this isn't, uh, it's not new that the UW system has not been funded properly. This is, you know, been happening for 10, 15 years. Uh, you know, when you continually don't fund a institution properly, eventually the budget will look bad. And we have to continue, or we have to bring funding back up to limits, you know, even if it's progressively, so that these schools don't have to lean on their um, alumni and uh, tuition in order to fully fund their schools properly. I'm not necessarily here to micromanage our universities. You know, I'm not going to pretend that I know all the different programs or all the different things that happen within these universities. I know that the people within these universities are working really hard within their different fields to make sure that people are as, as informed as possible, getting them ready for the workforce. And we need to make sure that in the end, these people that we want in our workforce aren't burdened by tens of thousands of dollars of student debt in order to start in the workforce. You know, we have to make sure that they're ready and that we have the right facilities and the right um, uh uh, availability of um, products or I'm using products, but I mean to say uh, like services within these facilities uh, that they're well funded, even though it goes beyond my scope of understanding some of it, that doesn't mean that it's not necessary for these different types of fields. I mean, I could probably give some guidance in terms of criminal justice from the 20 years ago when I took that, but I probably wouldn't be able to tell you what the nursing department needs. I mean, my cousin is a biochemist. He has his PhD in biochemistry. He talks to me, and some of the stuff goes right over my head because he has taken the time to understand it. He's taken eight to 10 years out of his life to understand these very complicated things. So, yes. All right. We have come to the end. And it is time for closing statements. Each candidate will have two minutes, and we're going to go in the reverse order of the opening statements that we had to begin today's forum. So that means, Kyle Kehoe, you go first. Thank you to the Chamber. Uh, thank you, Jonathan. You I appreciate um, this opportunity. This is my first time running for office. Uh, you know, I was approached last year to run. Um, it's been an exciting journey so far. I've uh, met so many great people, not only within party, but also within this community. You know, I have been trying to run this campaign differently than a typical campaign. You know, to me, uh, a political campaign should be, especially at a state assembly level, it's about community. It's about getting in there. I've gone to every single event that I can think of. I've gone to uh, your fall fests. I've gone to your parades. I've been inside of your communities. Uh, I've, I've seen uh, ribbon cuttings at your schools. Uh, and I want to make sure that uh, you have representation uh, that will work with both Democrats, Republicans, independents. It doesn't matter because that's what I've done my entire life. I've been in sales for the last 15 years. It never mattered to me what somebody's political affiliation was. They gave me something. They need me to fix it. They need me to find compromise. They need me to find uh, them a solution. That's what I'm here to do. And that's what I'll do for the people within the 55th district. I believe that we have a uh, beautiful community within the 55th district. And I think that we can only make it better and make it a place where it can thrive for generations. And in doing so, or with that ability, I do believe that with representatives that will talk to anybody, that will engage with anybody and compromise with anybody, we'll have a better representative within the 55th district. Thank you for your time. Thank you for listening. And we'll see you on the campaign trail. Nate, two minutes for a close. Thank you very much. Jonathan, again, thank you for, for uh, being moderator. Thank you, uh, Venture Project. Again, really great. And actually, thank you to Kyle for, for being here as well. I think this has been obviously one of the, the best opportunities for voters to hear really where we stand on some of the big issues. Um, again, I, I am a Winne lifelong Winnebago County resident. I've been here my entire life. Um, as, we, as I look at what policies have affected us in the state, my first thought goes back to how is this serving the 55th district how is this serving winnebago county and so 
I, I've had the privilege of running not only one time before, obviously two years ago, but it really felt like I was running for the first time again this year because of the, the redistricting that happened. And so it's been a real pleasure getting to a lot of the new communities and integrating myself as much as I physically can over, over the course of the last how many months and, and really starting to learn from a lot of local stakeholders what's important to them, what's needed. And I think that's really what's going to be key here is you're, you're going to want someone who, yes, isn't always going to be the, the party line stomper. You want someone who you, you might even disagree with, but you're at least going to be heard every single time. And I think we had some issues with that in the past uh, in, in other districts. So I, I do think at the end of the day, I'm going to be the most available uh, representative I can physically be. Um, I've already proven that through this entire campaign cycle, as well as, again, I, I do have a pretty strong track record of being uh, quite bipartisan down there. I actually set the tone in my first term, kicking indoors, sitting down with legislators, and I scared them uh, on, on the opposite side of the aisle because they were not used used to having a Republican come to a Democrat and talk to him. And I think that's really uh, the embrace of what I, I would say what is arguably a next generational uh, uh, trait that we're really willing to come to the table and have those conversations. And that's what I plan on doing. So again, thank you very much for having us and, and thank you for attending today. That is all the time we have for today's forum. I'd like to thank both Kyle Kehoe and Nate Gustafson for joining us today. I would also like to thank our sponsor, the Oshkosh Chamber of Commerce, uh, for putting on today's forum. And a special thanks to our host this morning, the Venture Project for allowing us to use their beautiful space.